All right. Well, hello. This is the uh, probably our second podcast ever, I think. First time for you guys. Yep. We got first time here. A cart over here from Boss, and my good buddy Don Collier from SOK Great Lakes, formerly SOK North. Known Don since 2018, when I bought a chocolate lab, and I needed the thing trained before Boss was even a thing. So, yeah. How's it going? Yeah. A cart. It's gone gone from yeah. way back before the brand to training your dog to now kind of a part of us. Yeah. Yeah, way back to hey, uh, shoot this box of shells and let me know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how about how it yeah. started out. And yeah. oddly enough, the reason these guys are here today is because they just got back from Arkansas and we gave them some steel reserve. Um, Aaron shot it the tail end of duck season down in Arkansas. Yep. Last week. No, the last week. Of, the, yeah, okay. the last week of, yep. of regular yep. season. And then last week, uh, it was last week on snow, Don was there. Yep. Yep. So what we try to do is keep a lot of the conversations dialed back other than, yeah, the stuff worked. Um, so I said, hey, let's do a little quick podcast so you can get it straight from the horse's mouth and their feedback. And then maybe what we'll do is just uh, talk about the field experiences and then maybe we can circle back to what led to us developing this and how we got to the point of you guys shooting it last week. And a lot of people have already been shooting snows with it. Mm -hmm. And I think there might have been some guys that duck hunted with it at the very end of the year. Not sure yet. Yeah, there was a few guys there at the end with the program members that got enough to have a few shots here and there mm -hmm. to close out season. So, Yeah. All right, Don, you were the first guy that – one of the first guys that shot boss – back before anybody knew about it. That had been like early season, honker hunting, yep. 2018. Mm -hmm. That would have been, yeah, a month or six weeks before like the official launch of the company. Yep, that's correct. We, uh, that was a fun hunt too. We literally had mm -hmm. to convince a bunch of Michigan goose hunters that two and three quarter inch fives were the load <laughs> for the day, which wasn't an easy task to begin with. Yeah. And then it was a small feed. We were hunting like 35 birds that day just to go in and see what happened. And three to 400 decided to show up. So we shot 35 geese, which was our limit. And I think we only had one cripple out of the 35 that we shot. If I'm not mistaken, I remember the video. You had some GoPros yep. and there's the rain out. But there were a couple guys on the left that were still shooting steel. Yes. So we... It, and not to say we've ever been banging on steel, but everyone who's ever shot has had the experiences that most people complain about, which is what opened the door for Boss to, right. to get in the market with something more dense. And my thoughts were like, I never really like bashed steel, but it was a crippler. And I don't really think that maybe the original steel was that much, in, was that inferior relative to where it is now. I think a lot of it is people didn't know how how it worked or what its limitations were because lead was just that good. And that's where bismuth kind of came back and people that shot lead knew what it was like and knew bismuth was right, right there. So that, that separation between the two. And that's why we always said, never close the door on, on something that we could, we could make a, a product in steel, but if it was going to be made and we're going to put our name on, it, it's going to be the best. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that said, I mean, the, the 2018 early honker hunt with the rain outs, you know, two and three quarter fives. Here we are today. We're going to be talking about predominantly steel threes because um, mm -hmm. that's all that we had available for you guys to take down there. Right. Um, it's just a range game. Yeah. You know, and, and cripples, what I'm, what I'm, it's kind of weird. Like five years in, you think you kind of figured out what ballistics are like and what you can do with everything. But bismuth can cripple. Tungsten can cripple, lead can cripple, so can steel. It's just more apparent with steel because I think guys are used to taking shots further than 30 yards. Outside of the effective range, for sure. Yeah. So uh, we know the effective range is probably a little bit more than what we're, we're stating, but because we want crippling to be minimized and the shell's designed for that 30 and in um, shot, that, well, how did it work? I mean, effectively, the 30 yard and in is, that's like the sweet spot. Now, granted, you're going to have those shots where if you're in front enough and you get that head shot, it's going to fall. But given field data of what 
you know, just sitting back and watching. And that's mm-hmm. something I even did, like, on the second volley of the of the snow goose hunt. I just pulled up and didn't even shoot. I just sat there and watched and sit, saw what failed. How many guys were in the line? I think we had, what, 10 or 11 there that, we, that morning? Yeah, that morning we had 10, I think. And everyone was shooting number threes, yes. our stuff? Okay. Yeah. Everybody, everybody was shooting number three, still reserve. That's an ounce and an eighth, three-inch shell. Mm-hmm. Um, and moving at 1550. 1500. 1500. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Give or take, plus or minus. Right, right, right. Anything that was within the spread, and I say the spread, kill hole, the front of the kill hole was probably 25 yards. The back of the kill hole was probably 35, 40. And relatively everything that came in, and shot calls were good calls, you know, really efficient calls of they're, they're right there. Anything within that spread fell, and it was dead dog like there was nothing walking around within the spread whatsoever yeah and i mean even the the first really good rip we got at it when we had a you know there was geese from the left side of the spread to the right side of the spread they were in there thick everybody's literally anticipating the call shot we came up and i think uh we were estimating we shot probably 26 birds out of that the very first really good volley that we had was it a spin it was not a spin it was mm. it was just kind of like uh we're low we're gonna pass by we never really got the, the day we used the steel reserve we never really got that balled up spin to where we could just let it rip yeah it we, ne- more, we never had the vortex yeah it, you know the the claim to fame vortex it was ma- mostly a group that would swoop in low to come in and check out and then we took them out yeah okay. and also too there was a feed building across the road and they just didn't want to let them swing far enough to get pulled by the feed so when they got yeah. in close we were, we were letting them eat so sure. it wasn't passing but it wasn't committed they're just no. looking yep. right. yeah right i mean you had you had your 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 pairs and you know a mm-hmm. bird here or there that would mm-hmm. drop in the in the spread like yeah. actually hit the ground yep um but the majority of the shot call with having 10 people in layouts there it was all 25 to 35 yard shot yep. calls and well and People can say what they will about snows, and they are built a little bit lighter duty than a goose, maybe a little lighter than a mallard. Um, but, again, back in the early days, right about the time you were shooting that stuff on early season, we had guys up in Canada um, shooting snows on their way down with number fives as well. And for me, that was enough to know that we really had something because usually from you know what I know about snow goose hunting and steel shot, most guys are shooting twos ones bbs they're not shooting threes they're not shooting fours anything smaller than that right right like what what did you shoot so prior i always shot threes number three steel I like number three steel and Aaron. i was a three inch two guy yep. and i was primarily okay. the shooting specs and snows down in arkansas you mm-hmm. know pretty much name the game and i was shooting three inch well i was shooting experts Pretty much the same. Well, that thing. was one of the last three inch one and eight ounce number twos. That's what moving at fifteen fifty. I would say that of all the steel that I shot, that was not the last shell that I shot, but that was the most consistent steel load that I would I would shoot. You know, mm-hmm. um, I don't have any problems with it. You know, people say it burns dirty. Maybe it does. Um, patterns decent. You know, for a cheap shell, but right. nothing's cheap anymore. Nope, no. nothing's cheap anymore. No. But anyway, so number three steel. I felt like you guys were going to be undergunned. I was wanting you to take number ones with, but all the program members already had whatever we yep. had built up. They were playing with that. So I thought it was going to be kind of a uh, – I didn't think it was going to work that great. So and, – and, and here and here was why I knew – you and I had talked about this mm-hmm. multiple times, but I told Don, I said, all right, I want to play the numbers games with snow goose hunting. I want the most pellets flying because you're just ripping – you're ripping through eight, ten shells in a – in a magazine tube so mm-hmm. let's put the pellets out there and sit, let them fly and see what happens and it, but that's that's the problem that's where people start crippling shit that's that pisses right. me off that's right yeah that's right so you know it's testing it that and but it turned out that's all we had so i mm-hmm. mean we can only take it so don and i kind of collectively sat there and talked during the hunt it's like okay these threes are doing really really good out to 35 yards like mm-hmm. right here there absolute just there there's nothing crippled and then as you could see the the flock starting to get outside you'd see those one or two that would fall out from either collateral damage or Mm -hmm. somebody still shooting yeah um yep well that happens i mean that yeah that that i mean that's the snow goose game so we said the with the ones it's like okay here it is that would be the most effective pellet size for did you still have any ones left over 
or no? I have, I have probably had like maybe 20. Did you shoot them? I did. Could you tell any difference between? Not mixed in with just mm. rapid yep. fire. Yeah. I mean, it was. Yep. <clears throat> but, and again, a lot of times like snow goose hunters, I, I would still recommend a number one because I know I've, I've snow goose hunted enough to know that on the days where they're not committing, they're going to give you the look or they're going to fly over high, you're still going to cut into yeah. them. It's just, right. you got too many guys that are wanting to kill shit and it's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, the snow goose game too, it's a trigger pulling sport. Nobody yeah. wants to sit there and wonder. Everybody wants to let them rip. And it shouldn't be that way, but that's yeah, the nature of the, the beast. the nature right. of the beast. So. That conservation season's just a whole whole other animal mm -hmm. for sure. But right. you, you back it out of the conservation season to just a normal hunt at the farm on our specs. We're going to shoot, given this is what we're having to shoot, we're going to shoot ones with a full choke or – uh, a modified choke within yeah. steel, but yeah. a, the, a full pattern. Right. And you're going to pick out each bird, and then it's going to, you know. Well, and that's the other thing, too, that what we, by designing the load and kind of happening upon an improved version of the War Chief wad, you know, we first shot this stuff. It's 95, 98% patterns. Really good results. And it, yeah, and it didn't matter how fast we moved it. We tried moving it slower to try to keep the pattern nice and tight. And with the, the powders that we have available, by moving it slower and the primer that's in that, that hull that we've got for steel reserve, as soon as you'd freeze it, the, the pressure would drop off. It'd start burning really dirty, and then the velocity drop was, was horrific. So by building that pressure up and then increasing the velocity, and they move pressure and velocity with the powder kind of burn. They, they, they coincide to a certain point. But then you get to a, a point where your velocity levels off and then your pressure just keeps going keeps up building. and up and up. Mm. So what we like to do for that particular payload and wad when we optimize the load is we will run that up to the max velocity and then start watching where the powder burn or the pressure burn just keeps on going up, 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 up. Mm. And then that velocity kind of, it stabilizes. So they, they kind of run up together and then your pressure goes like this and then your velocity kind of does that. So where you find that point of intersection, that's where we like to say the load's optimized. So where it happened to be on this, not surprisingly, is right around that 1,500 feet mm -hmm. per second. And we didn't lose any any pellets in the pattern. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it's because we're using like precision ground steel shot, and then we've got that war chief wide. So all the elements, at least for the ounce and an eighth version, all the elements of the war chief that made that work so good for the buffered version of bismuth, um, has a cushion wide double gas seal. The pedals are like on hinges that that rapidly open, and it's counterintuitive to a lot of the stuff out there now in the market where wad stripping chokes. You get like this sabot that goes out, and then the wad kind of separates later on down the the line. What we found is the quicker you can release a shot from the wad, the more efficient the pattern is. And like we said, ninety eight percent. I mean, it's hard to argue with that. Yeah. And then the distribution is just beautiful. And we were seeing that through not just modified, but all the way down to like improved cylinder and cylinder. Checks. Yes, you've messed with that more down in Mississippi than, <clears throat> yeah. than we have. We, yep. we shot yep. it with, with a Muller uh, passing choke and then um, factory modifies and some right. Benelli's and some other guns. And it just uh, everything you shot, right. it was just perfect. Yeah, all yeah. testing, all the testing tested out. I like, I mean, just as consistent a pattern as you could want mm -hmm. for the given range of what your choke is right. constricted. And like he was saying, even when we were in Mississippi looking at it, hit the cardboard, it was just uniform no matter what choke you threw it. So through. you had seen this before. When did you? We were in Mississippi at the end together? of the year when he was doing some pattern testing. Oh, no, over in Arkansas. Yeah, or yeah, not Mississippi, okay. Arkansas. Okay. Yeah, Arkansas, excuse me. All right, yeah, so yeah, that, there towards the end of the year, um, I had a case i got a case of the threes and a case of the ones mm -hmm. and um i was shooting them next right beside the war chief fours and so i had a hunt with some buddies down in arkansas on a uh, a watershed that had finally got some water um so we had a variety of birds that could be but you targeted specs right no we were we, well there were specs teal mallards gadwall so there's like a variety um and so we ended up that morning consisted of more or less it was a teal shoot and so given once we got there to where we were hunting i mean our max shot that we could really just decoy a bird was going to be about 40 yards and then the closest was going to be about 10. um yeah but with teal i mean you can kill them with with rock salt uh yeah yeah but you guys i thought you guys were shooting more 
more speckle bellies than anything. And well, that, we were you know. we were trying to, and okay. they they dipped out by that time after the after the thaw. Yeah. Um, so at the, at that point in time, I chose to go with a, a just a plain cylinder choke in the A four hundred I was shooting, and mainly because of they said the teal were going to be ripping through there. So exactly that mm-hmm. we were ha- we I was needing something that opened up quick shooting the threes. Yep. Um, so the threes ones and the war chief fours, mm-hmm. two three quarter inch fours. Mm-hmm. Um, the threes did excellent out to that 30 yards, you know, within well, shit. I would hope it worked further than that out on, on teal. Well, yeah, it w- but shooting a cylinder choke. Oh yeah. I was shooting yeah. a cylinder choke. I didn't, I never had a question of any bird that came in yeah. from a goose or a mallard or a yeah. teal to 30 yards. I shot it. I had enough pattern coverage to where it was there, but mm-hmm. not enough, not big holes in it to where a teal would fly through it. Right. Um, right. And of course we saw the war chief. So that some of the guys I was hunting with, they never even shot boss, period. They knew what boss was, but never even had their hands on it. Yeah. And so they they shot ones, threes, and then the fours in the war chief. And they could they kind of gave the same consensus of that. It's like, all right, we're seeing really good results here. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, that mm-hmm. war chief is the third shot to where we need to be firing that third shot if we're outside the spread. Yeah. Real quick, Mason, can we have Meg get us – some of that feedback that's coming off those QR codes. I want to read through some of that while we're while we're recording this. Yeah, good idea. And then, what? So, fast forward to the snow goose hunt last week. What was the guys down the line? What was their feedback? What were you hearing from them? They had smiles on their faces to start with, and everybody had the same opinion that anything that they felt like they should kill, they were killing, and they were surprised that we were getting collateral as far as we were. With threes. With threes, with yeah. threes yeah. And I think a lot of that just has to do with that that pattern density. Yep. It's got it's got to it, – that's the only thing it can be because you run out of ballistic energy really, really freaking quick with yeah. a steel pellet. Yep. But it's just maybe it's the, the, the tighter pattern, multiple hits type of thing. So I, you were seeing them. Were they so. dropping? Like last year when we went was the first – I don't think you were with us last I year. I wasn't with you last year, no. Same group. We Same were with, group, yeah. With Goose Reapers, yep. yeah. Yeah. Um, we were that was the first real like big big hunt that we were able to to use war chief and then it was still kind of in the pre-development stage of things and i mean you're still seeing the birds that drop out at 100 yards yeah. and every now and again you'll get yeah. some that drop out 200 at, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, we so you still saw thing. that yeah, we still okay. saw oh, yeah. that okay and literally too like what everybody's saying is like aaron touched on earlier it's just the pellet count when you're mm-hmm. throwing that many pellets in the air in that tight of pattern you're just cutting holes yeah. in the group so it's fair to say based upon what you've shot mm-hmm. what you guys shot last week 30 and in no problems yeah modern. absolutely not there's no excuses from yeah. from whatever you choke you want to shoot mod mm-hmm. five to cylinder. Yeah. well and that and that's and, and really there's a lot of things that kind of inspired me to to go down this path of steel with one of them was we were making our own wads mm-hmm. so we've demonstrated and developed capability to manufacture our own stuff so we weren't going to be strung up with what we could buy commercially then meeting with joel strickland when we recorded a podcast up in the office earlier in the summer he said why don't you make an arkansas timber load in steel number threes and make it affordable so all these arkansas guys can have it because we seldom shoot anything outside of 30 yards so i was kind of thinking about it. i'm like oh well Maybe. So we started goofing around with some of our, our wads that we currently had, and you start throwing patterns. It's like, this is insane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we developed, we, we had to make the wad thicker because we were getting some burn through um, that would cause some barrel scoring if you shot a lot of it. So all that we had to do was just change the core that would have a little bit more taper on it so that the bottom of the, the wad had thicker pedals than what was up in the top, and we kind of made a little dish for it to fill up that volume. And we ended up getting that. It was basically the ounce and a half bismuth wad that turned into an ounce and an eighth for steel. And then we had a special, um, not leftovers, but it was a special buy in some hulls that we had access to. We've got a pile of them. And we had the powder that we get our hands on. We said, hey, now now we got something. So, and, and there are guys that complain about price. And, you know, I'm not as price sensitive as I used to be. Um, but we understand that, you know, feedback comes in and people want to have that, you know, shell right around a dollar and, you know, 
right now they can't afford to shoot boss, but they want to be in the brand. So this is kind of that perfect segue to get them in on it. I want to I want to touch yeah, on that too yeah. because of like price sensitivity. But one of the big things that a guy that never even shot boss until I handed him that money bag mm -hmm. of steel out there on the mm -hmm. snow goose hunt, he picked up these holes. He goes, "Holy shit, this thing's like perfectly clean." Mm -hmm. And it goes back to okay, yeah, we want to keep it, we want to keep it a economically affordable round, but we still want a quality boss product. Well, and that's where and that's the where reason that it burns clean is because that's where you optimize that load, where you've right. got your pressure kind of hitting pressure, and velocity peak are kind of right in that 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 box that we like it to be in, and then you know the clean burning and everything else is just kind of. It's free, really. Right. It's the way you should do well, it. Well, it's because we're not going to cut the corners, even though right. it's a it's a cheap. No, I'm not going to say it's cheaper. It's a more affordable round. Well, we're down to the copper plating, you know, yeah, like we're still not going to cut our corners in in what we're making. Yeah, that's a branding thing, but it's also like a detail thing. You know, does it cost more to put copper on it? Yes, but it doesn't really translate down to the, the consumer is not necessarily paying for it because it relatively low cost. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just one last, it's like the finishing detail finishing that goes touch, on yeah. yeah. And I feel like, too, the group that we had out there, they were very seasoned waterfowl hunters in mm -hmm. general. It mm -hmm. wasn't their first time in a snow goose spread. They've shot multiple rounds at these birds in the past. Were you guys in layouts or were you in backwards? We were in layouts. We were, okay. It was an edge hide. Okay. Edge hide. Okay. And then we were, yep. um, you know, so... So again, too, in that environment, the shot calls typically 25 to 35 yards when you're doing an edge hide. Was and it windy? It was not windy. So it's not like you, they were yeah. turning and gone at right. 60 in, no. a, in a heartbeat. So no. you, got to, you got to poke at them for we a while. We got to poke at them for a while, yeah. And, a, and another note, you know, that I kind of made while we were there, after we got through shooting, I was kind of asking everybody, like, what type of gun. So everybody was hunting with a anywhere from a Stoger M3500 to a Remington Versamax, your Beretta A400s. Benelli's, mm -hmm. um, M, I was shooting an M1. There was an SBE2, maybe an SBE3. Mm -hmm. um, Don yeah. was shooting the SX3 Winchester. He went back to that one. Well, but do that. So I mean, we had no goose so we had a variety of guns, and everybody was fully cycling, no issues, mm -hmm. everything shot fine. Well, and it shoots. To me, it shoots like a trap load. I mean, it, there's some recoil there, but man, it, with a, only an ounce and an eighth of payload than the cushion wad, mm -hmm. yep. it shoots soft. Yes. Yeah. Agree. Very soft. So we got some other feedback from another guy because we had some war chief there with us as well. He goes, whew, that war chief's a heavy hammer compared to that steel shot. Yeah, but you're shooting an ounce and a half, yeah, three that's, inch. That's right. Yeah. That's so right. The, so. the first day we, we was all, uh, we had burnt through the uh, steel reserve that we had. Mm -hmm. So day two, we started getting into the the war chief and day three they had a big day and they they shot a lot of war chief that day and you had bailed out on day three didn't you yes yeah and then you stayed did. there till the there was an afternoon no, hunt. i was i was out day three also okay okay yeah yep. well i mean it, you're talking about a dollar shell versus a two dollar shell or whatever war chief sells for so it should be better yeah it that's right be. that's right you know and and there's better stuff besides you know war chief with this tungsten stuff we're coming out with and I shot tungsten when I was hand loading before we started boss found bismuth and I still say today that there's not a shot that I made with tungsten that I can't do with with a boss shell mm. um but again I was never shooting at 80 yards but and, and, and I'm not what, going to that's yeah. what we discussed too as a group out there you know like Sure, the war chiefs are extending your range by 10 yards easily, but the effective range of the shooter is probably about the you know there as well. Yeah, you get to a point where 90% of the shooters can't outshoot the shell. Exactly, and a lot of it there are guys that that can stretch that that legacy shell out as far as I can shoot a war chief shell. But you know, and I'm a decent shot, but some of these guys, but I also know what patterns look like at right. the distances that they're yeah. shooting it's like you may think that you're that capable but there's just there's a lot of luck that yeah. get, that goes into yeah. that it's all chance at that yeah. yeah yeah so again i can shoot whatever i want we make all of it i'm not a tungsten guy right. and it's not just because of cost I'm, I'm just not my thing and i'm still not a steel guy you know i i'm not going to be able to hunt enough where i can shoot steel legacy war chief tungsten you know, I'm I'm a I'm kind of a war chief guy. That's kind of where my my heart's at because that's, you know, 
one of my, I'm not going to say my proudest moment at Boss, but probably one of them. I mean, that, that really came together and it set us on a new trajectory with us being able to go more vertical with, you know, on the manufacturing mm -hmm. side. Yep. Molding presses. Now we're going to have more molding presses. There's a lot more equipment that, that we've been able to buy to support that, that product line. And, you know, one of the second order effects that came down as a result of it is now this, this steel offering, yeah, right. which is going to help get a lot of people into the brand. Right. Our buying power, being able to produce more shells, is going to um, drive down the overhead cost to some degree. Shipping, everything on. you know. So for guys that want to complain and say, oh, we're whatever boss that's sold out, you had a good product, now you're ruining this, that, the other, that's all background noise. I mean, there's a business and a movement that goes in there, and um, it's not about making money. It's us trying to de deliver high-quality ammunition to all these waterfowlers, and then it's going to keep going upland, and you know we want to get into to new markets too. Right. So, let me look real quick. These are replies that have come back from the the QR code that went out on uh, program to program members. Okay. Let me see here. Here's some ones. Uh, we we're hunting snows in PA. Didn't get a lot of action. Maybe shot nine rounds over three days. Ammo is very good. Twenty-five or thirty. Dropped one stone dead. Let's see, really good shells, clearly better than other entry steel that I've shot. Uh, shot four snows in the head all around 30 yards, dead in the air. Fifth one was body shot, hit hard, wasn't stone dead until he hit the ground. I wouldn't call it a cripple, okay. Snow goose hunting on the 15th. My buddy was testing the one and three uh, steel reserve. On one birdie shot, two of your number threes. May have tickled the bird on the second shot. Third shot was number one, stoned him. And here we go, 70 yards. Nothing really proud about publicizing that because I, I don't like that with steel um, really love the shot size boss is one of the best ammo out there for sure uh, great knockdown power once performed well on snow geese at 30 so guys are at least they're trying they're telling us they're keeping inside 30 um, impressive load absolutely loved them hopefully they'll make a 20 gauge which we will um, doo -doo 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 -doo. let's see here that was ones let's go to threes um, cycled without issue Benelli M2 snow geese I was expecting to find the ones more potent, but I actually think the threes were pretty even. For 25, 30 yard shots, I think I'd actually prefer the threes, which I wouldn't have guessed, neither would I. Right. But this is why we're doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Great great ammo, awesome knockdown power. We patterned at 30, in circle 30 yards, uh, 26 inch barrel, factory mod, excellent patterns, 97%. That was with the factory mod and then also Rob Roberts T2. Um, shots up to 40 on, on, he calls it cracklers. Assuming shots up to 40 and cacklers and specs would have gone bigger or shot closer, but they knocked him down. Okay, we're telling people 30 and in. Okay, here's Meg highlight of this one. Guys, first off, I hate steel shot, but a buddy and I use these today. Shot a two man limit on Greater Canada's inside 30 yards, they're hammers. Further shot was 35 yards, it was devastating, but another shot was needed. Well, it's a big goose, with number three steel. Uh, best shot, best steel shot I've shot in years, dumping snows left and right. Only bird I crippled was on the last shot and had a distance of about 70 yards. Well, no shit. Uh, if I couldn't afford your good stuff, I would shoot this to try save some cash while shooting boss shell. I love Brandon and the company, everything you do. Well, that's nice. At least I didn't shoot him at 70 yards. Otherwise, I'd be pissed at him. Uh, <laughs> crashes the white birds. Anything under 35 yards, stone cold dead. Hopefully, we get him in 20 gauge. So do we want to talk about what the 20 gauge offering is going to be, payload Yeah, size? that's going to – the way that we're we're – machining up the cores for the inside that's basically taking the 20 gauge mold and then the core that makes the inside the shot cup um that had to be tapered down so it's going to be right around seven eighths of an ounce or just north of it mm -hmm. we can't quite get to an ounce without building an entirely new mold first year out we're going more heavy in 12 gauge if we have to build a new tool we will but for now it's right on par with a lot of the other offerings yeah, out there it, too it's a good payload for that size yeah and are yeah. we going to keep that in threes or go to ones with that? No, well? we're going to try with ones and okay. threes. Yeah, right. I'm imagining that. So, yes. At least you ordered boxes for ones and threes. Right. So 12-gauge, 20-gauge for now. I can't justify tooling it up, making it anything else, because then we're starting to mess with the powders that we need to make our mainline products that it, we're not going to go there. So yep. that said, where is your heart at next fall what shell between Steel Reserve, Legacy, War Chief, Tungsten, where are you going to be? I'm going to be with Legacy 20 gauge 3 inch 4s. You don't like the War Chief? I don't need them. Okay. A cart? 
Well, you're the test donkey, so you're going to keep shooting. Yeah, it all, I shoot. But where, where is your heart at? So honestly, so honestly, and and I can give this, I can give this honestly. So I've shot everything from the tungsten, the steel, legacy, the war chiefs by by the bulk, not just a few boxes here or there, like probably ten to fifteen cases total a year tested. I Did found, you really shoot that much? Shot a lot. No shit. Shot okay. a lot. Okay. So that that started in September from till season all the way till goose season or okay. conservation. So yep. I've, I think I've landed with the the war chief being the most versatile load we make from anywhere from ten yards to I don't want to say this, but to the fifty yard range because it can reach it if, oh, yeah. I, if it's choked right. And yeah. that, you know we we knew it could push further, but in what gauge? In twenty gauge yeah. and twenty eight gauge. So I, I bounced back from twenty eight to tw uh, twenty eight and twenty pretty much most of the year. So the only time you shot the twelve was with steel reserve this year. That is correct. Okay. And I mean I've shot well. I, whenever we had the protos of the war chief last year, I shot the twelve gauge mm -hmm. with that. So yeah. I mean I knew its capability, mm -hmm. but I've seen the biggest the biggest leap in bounds with the war chief and the 20 gauge um and i say this because like i said i can shoot birds at 10 yards and i can open it up with a cylinder choke and have plenty of pattern but not demolish the bird mm -hmm. or i can choke it down to my normal goose choke with a with a muller passing or my jebs 590 and i can reach out there at 50 if they're hanging up the specs are in the field whereas if i go to the tungsten load which i mean that's this is a new round we haven't came out with except for this year so the testing, I found that that load, even with a cylinder choke, it's a 35-plus yard shell. Not inside. Not inside 35 yards. It's so, it patterns so tight and so dense that it's a field load only. And so if you say, Aaron, what, what are you grabbing to go hunt this year? I'm going to grab a war. A let's go 28-gauge. 28-gauge. I'm going to go a 3-inch 4. War Chief or? War Lady Chief. Chief. Okay, 20-gauge. 3-inch number 4 War Chief. 12 gauge. I'm going to go a two and three quarter inch, three five, war chief. War chief. All right. So, you, you, what what gauge were you talking about when I asked you? 20 gauge. Okay. What about your 28? War chief. Fours. Three inch. Three inch. Fours. What if we make that? Well, that is going to go in two and three yep. quarter. Yep. That's, that's, be two and three that's quarter. going to be my. That'll I'll be shoot my. Two and three quarter yeah. and a 28 gauge. Yeah. I, I wanted to add there. Once we make that load, I will probably make that switch because I did find with the two and three quarter inches, I was more accurate. Mm -hmm. There's less crack. It's a it's a smoother shooting yep. shell. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 And the twelve gauge, you haven't even shot that. I had to find my twelve gauge to shoot it for the <laughs> conservation season. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The last time it was used was Clemens took it out last year. What did he use it for? The snow goose hunt. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. He took your yeah. gun because you had the SWAT yeah. tube on it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, cool. Is there so what a, I, I, I kind of want to touch on that two and three quarter inch. Yeah. Like, what can we give, tell everybody what to expect out of that? With what one? The two and three quarter inch 20 and 28 war chiefs. Or we is this have, something for you and I to tinker with? No, no, no. The only thing that, I think the only tool that we did not get to run was the two and three quarter 20 i know for sure two and three quarter 28 gauge i want to say we made two and three quarter 20s but we don't offer that in war chief i've not yet. Said, no not well in we're gonna make it yep. in both i can't even keep up with all the stuff that we're doing yep. now so yeah um so but yeah that's it's gonna be the same thing it'll be seven eighths ounce in both mm -hmm. um buffered same velocity as we're moving everything else mm -hmm. war chief and legacy line right around 1350 yep. and again you know velocity steel doesn't need to move at 1500 it's just as lethal at 13 because it but the reason we moved it faster is because we wanted to have that that good universal temperature operating range yeah. no matter how cold you get it would still cycle it still burn and it just so happened that that was 1500 we didn't do it to keep up with the joneses if i could make it at 1350 i would it just it doesn't like it you know the way that the hard shot is and the way the gases expand and all the, the shock and dampening and sealing with the wads and all that stuff, it just, that's where that has to live. That's where By it's design. Happy. And it works, that's where it's happening. Works yep. best. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't work around trying to achieve a certain velocity. And we didn't do that either with, with any of the shells we produce because velocity doesn't mean that much to me because math, like you said, right. because math. Because math. Because math. 
it just so happens that's where that load is optimized. That's where it needs to be to be optimized. That's it. Yeah. Most efficient. That's it. And, and even for me, too, I think once the war chiefs are offered in two and three quarter inch 20 gauge, mm -hmm. that would be my go to 20 gauge. Yeah. Round. Yeah. Just for the ease of recoil, yep. the quickness to get back on that second and third shot. Mm -hmm. A, a lot of my friends who are using the 28 gauges um, the past couple of years with the boss, they say that's the biggest thing they see is their ability to get on target quicker, mm -hmm. and they're shooting cleaner doubles and triples in the duck blind with the 28 gauges because it's easier to make the second and third mm -hmm. shot. Yeah. And nice. also, <clears throat> all my friends are like in one camp. They have their round, and you will not get them to deviate from that <laughs> round. And I remember. It is just, it's <laughs> funny how it's, no, it's got to be, we, I have two groups. I have the 20 gauge three inch four camp, and I have the 12 gauge three five camp. <laughs> those are the hilltop boys yeah, that used and that's to be where like. The, they fall in one of those two groups. Well, they and, were, and again, like it's kind of cool that we get to be on like we're filming this and recording this whole thing now because back in 2018, 19, the, converse, the conversation we're having now is the stuff that we yeah. would talk about all the time throughout the season. Yep. So it's kind of cool to like have a lens on it so other people can see how we right. walk through the process we do. But what was awesome is, you know, those Hilltop boys, yeah. originally they were three inch BB. Yeah. And then <laughs> you got them down to, what was it? It was, they went four, they went like fours, fives, threes, back to fours. Yep. And these were steel, like dyed in the wool, yep. Michigan honker hunters that were shooting BB steel. And now they, they're into fours, and that was like the first year in 12 gauge. Then they went to 20 gauge, then they went to 28 yeah. gauge. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been yeah. on several Michigan big honker sub gauge hunts. Mm -hmm. The 12 gauges aren't even making it in the truck anymore, mm -hmm. yeah. they're staying at the house. And it's not a novelty. Like, I think a lot of people are shooting 28 gauges now, and, and I'll give a ton of the credit to, uh, to Alex Brittingham. I mean, she was the one that wanted the 28 gauge back in 18. And I didn't have any tooling to make it. That's right. I figured it out, got the tooling, made it for her. And then I was kind of like, I was inquisitive and I wanted to know what was all this 28 gauge talk about. So 19, I got one, um, hunted with, developed loads for it, bought, then I used it in the, the 2020 season. And I fell in love with it. And yeah. there's nothing gimmicky about it. I know Wally's gotten a bunch of shit for shooting a 28. That's all he shoots everywhere. But now yeah, it's like everyone's in this 28 gauge kick, and I'm all for it because it is a very, very, very lethal gun. Yeah. Well, not just that. You're cutting down on recoil and then your noise Sound. pollution. Yep. yep. And I mean, it's, and it's effective. But birds don't, and I've seen this at our marsh. When you, when you touch off a 28 gauge, if you see birds that are flying further out when you're shooting birds over the decoys, those don't they don't react like they do when a 12 gauge goes no, off because no, you'll no. you can see birds a half mile out and the minute that you you clack off one of those 12s boom it goes off and you can see the birds they'll they'll kind of mm -hmm. cut on wing a little bit yep. Yep. not with the 28 gauge and even the 28s i mean we're able to hunt a little bit closer to the roost now in the fields mm -hmm. without blowing the roost mm -hmm. right because a lot yeah. of times with the 12 gauge if the wind was wrong and the wind's blowing toward the roost you run a good volley on honkers, the next group that gets up is heading the other direction. Right. They're not even coming to your field yeah. anymore. Yeah. And if you're keeping it sporty, I mean, inside the decoys, you don't need anything more. No. Right. Right. And I, and range, that's one thing that, that as caliber goes down, with the exception of 410, we can get the pattern to be more efficient. And that's what's driven me and like you and I kind of, yeah. we talk data and like your manufacturing right. background and, you know, process controls and tolerances and all that. That's the world I lived in right. too prior to this and before you got in the dog business and right. we just kind of got out of our, our, what we were born to do, I right. guess. And we're able to make these more and more efficient that they're not range limited because it's a smaller bore diameter. It's the same if not. I've seen some shots with old Dwayne. He's made stupid shots with a 28 gauge that you know you, you, it's just yeah. remarkable it's crazy well it's like you know at the christmas party he, he said aaron i never would have dreamed that i'd be shooting a 28 gauge now compared to growing up when i was shooting a 10 12 on the daily oh when when he and i first <laughs> when landon his landon's first season of hunting that inspired me to to start boss one of the inspirations Dwayne was shooting a red label over and under 12 gauge with three and a half inch steel. 
And it wasn't that long ago. And Dwayne's in his seventies now. Right. I mean, he was he was getting up there, and it's like. Dwayne, why are you doing this? Yeah. He wanted to reach out there and touch him. We've kind of totally changed that that whole narrative. I'm not going to say it's all boss, but I will. I'm not a cocky guy, but I'll take our company can take some of that credit yeah. for for some of that sub gauge stuff. Mm -hmm. And the sub gauges are fun. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I'm surprised that we didn't get to the the point of being able to make that that 28 gauge war chief and two and three quarter. But uh, oh yeah, I just got handed a note here from our producer Dirk. Do you want to touch base on the powder shortage? Yes, we'll talk about it real quick, then we'll, we'll cut this thing loose. Um, we've gotten a ton of hate from some of the people online, but online chatter, there's no such thing as bad publicity, I, I believe, when it comes to Facebook groups. So <laughs> all the people that like to stir the pot and talk shit, it really does generate a lot of business for it us. Does. And it I'm does. not gonna ever incite that type of stuff and get reactions out of people, but it works we're just trying to tell the truth and be transparent and uh people think launching new products when there's powder shortage is a stupid idea well yeah on, on the surface it is but i can get powder that i can't do anything else with but it creates an opportunity and it's one of the pieces that fell in place that allow us to create new product lines so that's why steel reserve came to fruition we were already working on steel reserve before the shortage existed and we're just kind of you know, we, we know the path forward, we're, we're marching lockstep. And then we find out, hey, you know, it's gonna be kind of jacked up next year. We still have not received, I think our last delivery of powder that we got was probably back in October or November. Nothing has come in. The new steel powder that we're gonna be able to use is on its way in, but we did have some of that left over from COVID. So, with the net, the global shortage of nitrocellulose, there's a lot of stuff moving around in pieces. And some people are saying that it's China is moving it to other countries. Um, it could be consumed elsewhere. Military contracts, budget funding. Latest thing I heard is if this, there's no way that all this military spending for Ukraine and Israel can happen unless there's a act of Congress, which I kind of don't believe because the government always figures out a way to get what they want. <laughs> but that was one of the things that may alleviate the shortage is if Congress does not pass the bill that would allow us to send more munitions to Ukraine. I really don't believe it. Um, I think it is just a general reduction in what consumers are going to get because the military is buying up all the demand and there's two powder plants that we have in the United States. In World War II, I believe there was like 14 or 15. We've got two. So um, there's still people that like to shoot guns. We don't have the wars that we did. You know, we're not shooting trench warfare, at least we weren't, up until two years ago in Ukraine. Thank God we're not involved in that. But that is really what I believe in, in, in my heart that is driving the shortage. Um, I don't know how much we're going to get this year. I know that our inventory is draining faster than with the new stuff's coming in. So there's gonna be a email going out to pro to everybody that place your order. We're gonna do pre-orders like we did during COVID. Um, some stuff will be able to ship from inventory. Some stuff we're gonna wait until it's made. We're not going to take an order for something we know we can't build. We've got amazing software that keeps track of all of our uh, uh, inventories. So we know what's available to be built with everything we have on hand. So we're gonna work towards that. Um, I think it's gonna be kind of a weird summer. We're gonna know, we'll know probably by August how this whole thing's gonna shake out. And that's when the selling season really gets going crazy. But with prices increasing, doing everything else, there is going to be an adjustment. So we're gonna give, I believe we're gonna give a month for people to get all their pre-orders in, lock that pricing in. You're gonna get all your outfitter customer orders committed. Yep. Um, yep. So everyone, hopefully, all of our existing customers will be able to get whatever they want this year. Um, and hopefully it gets better. You know, hopefully it gets better. But I can't say ammunition is ever going to be cheaper than it is today. No. It just And this is and this is also one of the driving forces that while we push like end of season start thinking preparing for next year. Therefore you're you're avoiding any kind of crisis that might happen with no powder or yep. pellets or we've solved our water. To some but. people's defense though most people had a terrible 
waterfowling season. Unfortunately. But in the central and in, in, in Mississippi flyway, I think it got real hot towards the very end. Mm-hmm. We never got shit in Michigan, really. It just seemed yep. like. Um, but again, I'm not in a position where I can go out and, and chase birds and travel the countryside to hunt. But uh, so hopefully guys still have some inventory left from last year. Um, and then for the new guys that, that want to get into boss, we got still reserve and you know, it's going to be, it'll be a good ride. We're going to make the best of a shit situation. That's all you can do. And we're here to help. I feel like that's what waterfowlers do do in general. Waterfowlers are great at making the best of a shit situation. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Look at the conditions we all hunt. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I There's nothing clean about it. Do you know how to eat a shit sandwich? (laughs) I learned this and I'm taking some classes at night. (laughs) I can't say I do. One bite at a time. <laughs> so. Fair. Pre-sale pricing locks in your pricing today. Did that get recorded? No. Oh, pre-sale, pre-order pricing is, yeah, that locks in existing pricing. So for program member pricing and uh, non-program member pricing, that's the other thing too. We can't open the program up. I mean, as much as we want to, that would be a very, very foolish decision that mm-hmm. customers would have every right to be pissed off about is if I started taking more people in and offered them, you know, uh, preferential uh, order placement, this, that, the other in the midst of supply constraints. We're not going to do that. We, we can't we can't do that in, in, in good conscience. So program members locked in. Um, I believe is this this is going to go to program members first, then release to everyone. Yeah, that's correct. OK, so. Uh, you know, can't make ammunition. We can at least make videos. Hey, you want to have any thoughts before we kill this thing? <laughs> I have none, man. All right. I think I'm good. Yeah. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, enjoy. Hopefully this was informative. We didn't waste too much of your time. I think we're going to come in under an hour, which is always the goal. Next time. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks.